Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm nearing the end of a series that I've been on for four or five weeks talking about living in the balance of grace and faith. I tell you, this is a powerful teaching that God has used in a miraculous way in my life. And I just believe that as I was making these programs, that God is taking these same truths and principles that have just transformed me. And I can see people all around the world being changed by these truths. I am really excited about it. I've made mention of this before, but I have to tell people when I'm excited because I'm always the same. It doesn't, I don't uh, have real highs and real lows, but I'm letting you know I'm excited. I believe God has used these programs in a supernatural way. I hadn't got time to go back and summarize everything, but I do want to mention that the end of this week is going to be the end of my offer of the new book. It's, it's actually the same book w with a new cover on it. And uh, it's a soft bound instead of a hard bound copy. And then I have a workbook and I have a CD set, a DVD set, and then an as seen on TV set of this teaching. So we've got a lot of materials on this and this Friday will be my end of making these project products available to you over the TV. So I encourage you to please get them. And I know that many of you think, well, I've seen it on TV. Why do I need to get the materials? There's a difference in sitting down and listening to this all at one time versus getting it little 30-minute segments. Plus, uh, you need to be able to go back over it. I can promise you this is the kind of thing you need to review, and it's also a tremendous way to share this truth with somebody else. You know, if every person watching this program who's been blessed by this teaching and it's impacted you got the materials and then shared them with somebody else, we could double the number of people right there that have been impacted by this. And so I really encourage you to get it. This is a keeper. It's something that would bless you. This last teaching is entitled, God Loves Me Unconditionally. And I've been talking about that you can boil all of these things I've been saying about the grace of God just down to it establishes a relationship with God not based on performance, but based solely upon what Jesus has done for us. And you know, when I teach this, it's amazing. This is good news. This is what the Bible calls nearly too good to be true news. You would think that everybody would love this, but this is actually what causes a tremendous amount of uh, persecution, and people get upset over this. Paul said it this way. In Galatians chapter 5, I was just reading in those verses on yesterday's program, in verse 11, he said, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision... Why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. And again, I made this point on previous programs, but this isn't talking about just the physical act of persecution, uh, or excuse me, circumcision, because Paul himself was circumcised. It's not that he's against it. He was against trusting in that. In other words, he's talking about legalism here, about trusting in something you have to do to gain God's acceptance. His point is that God offered a relationship with him as a free gift, completely independent of your performance. All you have to do is believe and receive or doubt and do without. But it is all about receiving what Jesus did for you. So he's saying here, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, he's saying basically if I was still living under the law, preaching that you have to perform and live holy in order to get God to do something for you, if I was preaching that, he says, why would I suffer persecution? Because then the offense of the cross is ceased. What is offensive to people is when you tell them that all of your good works doesn't make God love you more. It doesn't give you a leg up on anybody else. That is offensive to the person who is trusting in their goodness. That's really good news because the truth is that regardless of how good anybody's living, nobody deserves the things of God. But people who are religious Pharisees and trusting in their holiness get very upset when you start saying that you mean I've fasted and I've prayed and I've done all of this and you're saying that the drunk, the prostitute, the homosexual, whoever could come and receive from God 
and receive the goodness of God and the blessings of God without earning it the way I have? That is offensive to people because in a sense you're saying that all of your great goodness didn't give you any uh, extra inroad or special inroad unto God. It all just comes through Jesus. And the person who is trusting in themselves, that's very offensive to them. And I tell you, this is, this is what causes persecution right here. This is what offends people. But this is the gospel. And God loves you unconditionally and there is nothing you can do about it. You can't make God love you more. You can't make God love you less. Now, does that mean that therefore it doesn't matter whether you live holy? doesn't matter if you commit homosexuality, adultery, murder, rape, incest. Do those things not matter because God loves you unconditionally? As far as God's concerned, God loves you regardless of your performance. And a person who disagrees with that statement, and I know that there's lots of people watching this program who disagree. Let me just refer you to James chapter 2, verse 10, that says if you keep the whole law and offend in one point, you become guilty of all. So there's people that get offended when I say that God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. And even if you have committed homosexuality, adultery, rape, murder, whatever, God loves you and his love is unconditional. People get mad and say, that's not so. You have to live up to a certain standard. Those very people who get mad at me and would uh, contend with my argument, well, if you were to ask them, so are you perfect? Have you done everything correctly? I say, oh, well, no, I don't, you know, I don't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. I'm not perfect, but at least I'm living holy. Well, it's a relative holiness. They still have sins. If nothing else, the way that some of you feel about me right now is sin because <laughs> God loves me. I know that God loves me. He carries my picture in his wallet, and God is pleased with me. And if you're angry and mad at me, you know what? That's sin. You aren't like God. You're missing the mark. So what I'm saying is you may not be perfect, but you still believe that God is somehow or another more pleased with you than he is with other people. No, God loves us unconditionally. It is not based on your performance. But does that mean that your performance doesn't matter? No, not at all, because even though God doesn't change in his attitude towards you, if you go out and live in sin, the Bible teaches in Hebrews chapter 3, a lot of different places, Luke cha uh, Mark chapter 6 and other places, that you harden your heart towards God through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin hardens your heart towards God. It doesn't harden God's heart towards you. God is still going to love you. And if you have made Jesus your Lord, that's what it all revolves around. It's not whether or not you go out and lie or steal or do dope or whatever. That's not it. The only sin that the Holy Spirit convicts you of is the sin of not believing on Jesus. John chapter 16, verse 9. That's it. The rest of your sins are paid for. It all comes down to have you made Jesus your Lord. And if you accept Jesus as your Lord and accept salvation, then God loves you unconditionally and there's nothing you can do about it. But again, does that mean that you go live in sin? No, because even though God's heart towards you won't change, your heart towards God will change if you live in sin. You will become insensitive, hardened towards God. And the scripture teaches in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief comes for no other purpose, cometh not, but for to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. The thief is talking about the devil. He is out to steal, kill, and to destroy. And if you yield to him, Romans 6, 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you yield yourself to Satan, then you have yielded yourself to everything he wants to do in your life. Poverty, depression, loneliness, sickness... All, all kinds of stuff. And so there is still tremendous benefit to living as holy as you possibly can. But it's important that you recognize that holiness makes your heart sensitive towards God and it limits Satan's inroad into your life. And so as much as you can, live holy. 
but recognize you aren't ever going to do it perfectly. And instead of being under this mindset that I've got to be holy before God will answer my prayers or move in my life, if you think that, then when you don't live holy and all of us fail and all of us fall short of being the person we're supposed to be, if you have the wrong doctrine, then this condemnation and guilt is going to come upon you. You're going to bear about a sin consciousness that will separate you from the blessing and the power of God moving in your life, and it will cost you. So it's important that you live as holy as you can, but just recognize that when you fail to live holy and you do mess up, that God still loves you unconditionally. He didn't change in his attitude. And so you get back to doing what's right to sensitize your heart towards God and to shut a door on the devil so that he doesn't have access into your life. Boy, that is powerful. What I've said right there is powerful. It took me many, many years to sort through all of this. I understood that God loved me unconditionally. I knew that there was nothing I could do about it. So why then live holy? And yet there are so many scriptures that talk about living holy. And some people just can't connect the two. It took me a long time to do it. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And you know, I've heard that verse since I was a little kid. And I've always heard it interpreted that if you aren't holy... You can't see the Lord. And this is talking about more than just seeing him face to face, but you can't have a relationship with the Lord. You won't see his power manifest. In other words, it was tying your actions, or let me say it this way, it was tying your results, you getting results to your prayers to your holiness. If you don't have holiness, no man will see the Lord. No man will be able to receive from the Lord. But let me just back up a little bit and put this scripture into its context. I believe that this has been used completely contrary to the purpose that the Lord was using. In the previous verses, he was talking about the chastisement of the Lord and how that if you are a true son of God, you will be chastised. And I could spend a lot of time on this, but God doesn't chastise us with sickness, with problems, with failure, with divorce. That's not God's method of chastisement. It's just like God told us to spank our children, that the rod and reproof give wisdom, but you don't hit them over the head with a baseball bat. You don't punch them with a hot iron. You know, there's a certain way to correct, and God gave you extra padding right on your bottom, and that's a good place to do it. There is a right way to correct your children and a wrong way to correct them. Likewise, there is a right type of chastisement, and then there is a false chastisement that has been taught that says God's the source of all of your problems. Anyway, I hadn't got time to go through that, but in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says that the word of God is given for reproof and for correction, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God doesn't use sickness and disease. James chapter 1 says only good and perfect gifts come down from the Father of lights. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. And on and on we could go. So anyway, this is talking about chastisement. And then it starts talking about in verse 12, it says, wherefore. And sometimes chastisement seems hard and people get discouraged. And so he's encouraging you to lift up your brothers and sisters in the Lord and encourage them. In verse 12, wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. Again, this is not a literal thing talking about that when you walk, make sure that you don't amble. Just always go straight and turn 90 degree <laughs> angles. This is a symbolism talking about live in a holy, godly way. In other words, don't preach loving your brother and then, you know, stab them in the back and say critical things behind their back, but live what you preach. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Again, the symbolism is walk in a way that glorifies the Lord that's consistent with the things that you're preaching so that the lame, people who are weak, and who may not be established in these things, will be able to see, not only hear your words, but see your life. And through that, they will be healed instead of turned out of the way. Instead of being offended and turning away, they will be encouraged to go with the Lord because your life is consistent with what you preach. 
And then it says in verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's the verse we already quoted. Then in verse 15, it says, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. So look at this. Verse 14 is the one I read about holiness. In verse 13, it's talking about make straight paths for your feet so that those that are lame, those that aren't established yet, won't be offended and turn away, but rather they will be encouraged and helped. In verse 15, the verse after it, it says, Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, and encourage them and build them up. So the whole context of this is talking about you being a witness to other people you living in a way that people could see the power of God in your life. And in right in the middle of that context, he says, follow peace with all men. Again, this is talking about your interaction, relationship with people, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. This isn't talking about that if you aren't holy, you can't see the Lord. This is talking about that if you don't live a holy life, other people will not be able to see the Lord in your life. See, again, I think this has been totally misinterpreted and said that you've got to be holy to have God move in your life. This is saying you've got to be holy as a witness to other people. Other people aren't going to believe what you say if you can't walk it out. And that's what this is talking about. There are many, many scriptures, and there's lots of scriptures that promote holiness but it is not so that God can love you. God loves you in spite of who you are, not because of who you are. God loves you unconditionally. That's grace. But does that mean that you just go out and live in sin? No, because first of all, this grace, if you ever understand it, it will so captivate your heart with love that you will serve God accidentally better than you did on purpose before. And then secondly, you've got to shut a door on the devil so that he won't have inroad into your life. And then thirdly, how are other people ever going to see God in you if you're just saying it and proclaiming things, but your life is completely contrary to what you're proclaiming? So I still believe in holiness. You know, I am so glad that God chose me to preach on His grace, not only because you reap what you sow, and if I talk about the goodness and the grace of God, well, then I reap it. So I'm not just saying it for my personal benefit, but the moment you start preaching on the grace of God, I guarantee you the critics are going to say, oh, yeah, you're just preaching this so that you can have an ungodly lifestyle, so that you can have a mistress on the side someplace, so that you can steal money, so that you can do this. You know what? Nobody can accuse me of that. Most of you don't know me personally, and so you might be able to, you know, if somebody was to, uh, you know, raise an accusation against me, you might accept it or who knows whatever and just lump me in with everybody else. But anybody who knows me, I can guarantee you, I live a stricter, holier life than just about anybody I know. And I am not saying that to brag on myself, to pat myself on the back. I'm saying it's all a result of me experiencing God's love. But I'm saying I do live a strict life and I study the Word and I pray and I walk in love to the best of my ability more than most people. And so you can't say that I'm preaching grace to indulge my sinful lifestyle. And what this does, it just totally disarms the critics. There's a lot of people that, again, think that this preaching on the grace of God is just promoting an ungodly lifestyle, indulging all kinds of sin and terrible things. You can't look at me and say that. That's not what it's caused in my life. I live a holier life than most people watching this program. And again, I wouldn't normally say those kind of things, but this is like Paul. Paul was making this exact same point to the people who were criticizing him and saying that he was encouraging a sinful lifestyle. He says, you can't say that. Look at me. And he started listing all of the things. And he says, I'm talking like a lost man I'm speaking like a fool. In other words, this isn't the way he would normally talk, but those who were thinking that you've got to be holy and do all this, he says, look at me. I'm living by every standard you say that I should, and yet I'm saying that that is not what makes me accepted with God. It is the goodness and the grace of God that provides everything, and all I do is reach out and receive it by faith with thanksgiving. God hasn't responded to me. God doesn't owe me anything. 
God loves me because he is love, not because I am lovely. Man, that's powerful. And so for those of you who are just in sense and thinking, how could you preach this? You're encouraging sin. Well, look at my life, and I guarantee you it hasn't encouraged me to sin. I've been seeking God with my whole heart for nearly 44 years. It'll be 44 years, March the, the uh, 23rd. And I am serving God with everything I've got. I'm giving it all I've got. And the grace of God has taught me to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, like it says in Titus chapter 2, verse 12. It hadn't led me into sin. It's led me to seek God even more. So my answer to my critics is that, you know what? You just don't have any traction. You can't get a foothold with this argument because it hasn't worked that way in my life. And I could literally show you thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have heard this teaching on the grace of God. And it has set them free from sin, not free to sin. They are living a holier life now than they were before. Now, is that to say that nobody has ever abused the grace of God? Certainly they have. Paul talked about it. There's people that will maybe quote me or somebody else and say, oh, it's the grace of God, and so it's okay if I just shack up with this person and don't ever get married to him. It's okay if I do whatever. There's people that are going to abuse anything, but there's people that abuse your legalistic doctrine too. There's people that you know, use the word like a club to beat people up. And how many people have been offended and turned away from God because of all of the legalism and the hate that's spoken instead of talking about the grace of God? There's going to be abuses on both sides. So I'm not saying that, you know, nobody has ever abused the grace of God. No more am I saying that nobody has ever abused all of the rules and regulations and turned them into something that God never intended. But I'm saying that a person who truly understands the grace of God, it sets them free from the guilt and penalty of sin, not free to go live in sin. That is a huge difference. And I believe that my life and my testimony bears that out. That's exactly what it's done to me. And the thousands of people I've seen respond to what I'm saying that have been changed. I see the same thing work in their life. And I know that there are many of you that it's just a, a doctrine that is so ingrained in you that you cannot open up and receive these things. But I've been sharing straight from Scripture with you about things like this Scripture on the holiness without which no man would see the Lord. You can either choose to just continue to believe that that's talking about that God won't have anything to do with you if you aren't holy, or you could take it in context and let the Word of God speak and be open and honest with that, or you can just persist in your traditions and doctrines of men that make the word of no effect. I'm out of time today, but man, I've got a lot more to share, so I'm going to continue this on our program tomorrow. I encourage you to listen in. Also, listen to our announcer as he gives you information about these products. Remember that this Friday will be our last day, so listen to our announcer and then call or write today. Andrew's complete teaching titled Living in the Balance of Grace and Faith is now available in a new paperback book for £9.99. Contact us today to get your copy. In addition, you can also get this teaching in a companion study guide for £17.50. This teaching was also recorded live at a Gospel Truth Seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD. Or if you prefer, you can get this DVD as seen on TV. Each is available for 16 pounds. Remember to specify CD, DVD, or DVD as seen on TV when you contact us. This series is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awme.net and click on MP3 downloads on the left-hand side of the page. The fifth audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will send this fifth CD titled, God Loves Me Unconditionally, Free of Charge. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922-473-300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 
473-300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. And it was August the 9th or something is when we had that crusade. Yeah. And I mean, Joe was just telling us things that nobody in the Baptist church ever, nobody had ever gotten excited about the Lord. <laughs> this sounds strange, but it had never dawned on my mind that that was literal, that a man had been healed. I didn't realize that. And Joe, he, he was coming from a background. When he read it, he says, man, what about this guy that was healed? And he was talking about And it was just totally fresh. It was like a person was reading the Bible without all the religious bias I had. But we began to start experiencing supernatural things and just talking about it and dreaming about that, man, people could really be healed. And I remember the very first time that Joe, uh, there was a woman, I forget her name, but there was somebody who had cancer and was in Arlington Memorial Hospital. And Joe said, well, it says right here, if we lay hands on them, they'll be healed. And I said, do you really believe that? <laughs> and we talked about it, but we went up and prayed for that lady and she was healed. Laid hands on her. It was I don't know whether we masked her or not, did we? I don't remember it. her. I don't remember asking her anything. We just went in and said, we're going to pray for you and God's going to heal you. But we saw a lot of things like that, you know. We Didn't saw. know what we were doing, but we were doing it. But you know, that's the way the Word really is. It, Jesus said that He'd heal him if we'd lay hands on him. And we just took that literally. Well, you took it literally, and I was kind of riding along on his coattails. For more information, log on to awmi.net. Look to the left and click on Ministry News. Then click on today's TV news story and discover what's happening at Andrew Womack Ministries. Never despise small beginnings. Hungary, a former satellite of the Soviet Empire, is now a distribution center for Andrew Womack's teaching materials. From this small village house, boxes everywhere. <laughs> Andrew's translated books are being shipped across Europe in 19 languages, with more to come. Each book shipped from this house is a seed planted for a multiplied harvest to come. They got about every spot in here used. Log on to awmi.net. Look to the left and click on Ministry News. Discover what's happening at Andrew Womack Ministries.